Hey everybody, I'm the Bat Otter, and in this video we're going to be reviewing the second chapter of the Jojo Lands, and this chapter doesn't pick up exactly where the last one went off, and that was they formed a group, and they're going to go rob this Japanese man blind of his single diamond while he's visiting Hawaii for the weekend. Instead, it picks up with our main protagonist, Joe Dio, doing what he does best, and that is dealing drugs. An unsuspecting woman approaches him, saying, hey, you know, my friend Kate, you know, you got the stuff, right? I got some money, you got the stuff. And he says, you know, I don't know who you are. Why are you talking to me? I'm a child. Don't you know it's legal? And here's the thing, right? We've had interesting introductions to our protagonists in JoJo before, but I believe that the strangest and most anti-hero-esque introduction we've ever had is Jodio and Dragona's introduction in the last chapter. That was, they were being pulled over police, they rocked the police, they left, blew up the car, and delivered some bricks of cocaine to some actual drug dealers. And what's funny about this is, in the exchange between Jodio and this woman, he tells her, okay, you know what? You're right. I do know you. And I actually think that you owe me money. So go put your money in that cup over there. And then, you know, maybe we could talk about it. And she's confused. She doesn't understand what's going on. Really, what he's saying is, here, this is how you're going to pay me. But you're not going to pay me directly because then I'm dealing drugs to you. He gets so suspicious that he calls her out, says, you're a cop. Actually, get out of here. Scram. She goes on this thing that says, well, actually, uh, police legally can't lie to you. So if you ask me, look me dead in my eye and ask me if I'm a police officer. She says no, she puts the money in the cup. And Paco drops the drugs under a leaf, she picks them up, immediately draws her gun, on the ground now, on the federal authority of the DEA, you're under arrest. Go figure, she's a cop. The two police officers from earlier go body slam Jodio into the ground, they start cuffing him, and we get a very interesting exchange, I'm not entirely sure why Iraqi continues to hammer this home because this is our second introduction two chapters in a row that these police officers have shown up and been absolute fiends uh and i'll get to this but i wanted to read you guys the dialogue because obviously i can't share with you guys the chapter on the screen the dialogue reads like this good thing we were working with the da now man mind you this police officer has his tongue sticking out he's being an absolute animal and he says this to joe dio he says how's that cute big brother of yours been I've been dreaming about him every night. I still can't get that feeling of his butt clinging to my hand out of my head. I'm going to remember this real fondly. I'm going to take you back to a dingy concrete cell and feel your face between my legs. Your brother being there would be even better. It's rancid. I was reading that and I laughed, not necessarily because it was funny, but because I was very uncomfortable with the premise that Araki is re writing such a sick character. We've had evil characters before. We've had terrible characters. I mean, we had mob bosses, Dio, Pucci. You have all these terrible, terrible guys. Serial killers. But we've never had just sick pigs before <laughs> in the stories. And it really does make me curious as to what Araki is going to get at because he never does anything for no reason. I mean, you you guys know what I mean. You read an entire series of JoJo, you read nine parts of JoJo, and Araki never leaves something or mentions something twice without then following it up. So I believe that these police officers are going to play a hand later. But I loved Joe Dio's response to this. I, I think uh, the more that I read this character, the more that I'm starting to enjoy him. And he said, I should have killed you both when I had the chance. And he does it with this very cold look in his eyes. And he says, let me warn you. I know full well how cute my big brother is, so don't you dare say shit like that ever again. I'll let you go as long as you can just be happy with the memories. After all, there is no evidence. He pulls out a stand, he gets rid of the police, and the situation is resolved. We then cut to a very... It, the scene is so short it's only a page. He's meeting with a psychologist, and he says it's completely unrelated, and they diagnose him with antisocial personality disorder and being a psychopath. And in very ominous light, downlight, he says, could a guy like me ever be happy? I think it's possible as long as I try hard, but the truth of this world is that I'll always come across people like those in its seedy, unfair underbelly. People like those referring to these corrupt police. Sick police. Now, I 
said that I was going to get to that. This is why I think that Araki is making these police absolute fiends, and why the two interactions that we've seen on screen with our characters dealing with police is the same guy. And I think it's because he needs to morally justify his character's actions. If they were just beating up good, nice, uh, well-doing police officers who are doing their job and doing it properly, th there would be no justification for them to be attacking these police, these people with families, these nice people. So obviously he needs to make the police officers, he needs to make the quote-unquote good guys bad guys, morally reprehensible. So while it may be against the law and legally unjust, the people that they are doing, they have to make the antagonist at the level of the protagonist so that way you can justify their actions and still make them out to be redeeming characters who are not bad people, just in bad situations, you see? So I think that's why he's doing that. That's obviously why he's doing that in terms of the writing, but I'm curious to see in the story what he's going to expand upon that further because, as we'll find out later in the chapter, Araki is a very unpredictable writer, and that's what I've always loved about the guy. That's what's gotten me into JoJo, is that you can never quite speculate what's going to happen next. In comic books, in American TV, in all these other forms of media, you can generally predict, you can generally know what's going to happen in the next episode. What's going to happen in the finale? Who's going to appear next? What's going to happen? It's very predictable writing. Not bad, just predictable. So whenever you're opening up Araki, whenever you're reading his stories, you don't exactly know what's going to happen. Even if you know, you don't really know, you know? You guys kind of follow what I'm getting at here? So the story picks back up with them going to the other island in Hawaii. The screen capture I have on screen is of them driving through the landscape. And let me just say, Araki, ever since Jojolian, has gotten very good at drawing and creating these environments and landscapes that make you feel the ideas, that really do a good job at expressing the ideas of the places that they're at. In this case, it's Hawaii. It, the second that I saw these panoramic shots, these landscape shots, it immediately reminded me of my time back in California, driving through the mountains. Now, California and Hawaii are different places, the environment, the idea, the very peaceful, relaxing setting remains the same. Uh, so I really liked that panel. I really liked those parts of the story. And we get to the next guy's mansion. And as we're there, we find out that the Japanese man in question isn't leaving the mansion. doesn't seem like he's going to leave at all that day. But there's a pool. There's some glasses outside with drinks in them. They said, okay. When he leaves to the pool, we'll go in. 15 minutes tops, in and out, we get the diamonds, we rob this man blind. So that's exactly what they do. They wait for the guy to go outside. Joe Dio's the scout. We get uh, Usagi, the hot dog guy. We get the introduction of his stand, which is Mate Kurasai, a name of a King Crimson song, also words in Japanese. And the setup is there. They're ready. They're quiet. They're heist. They're heisters. They're bank robbers. They're ready to go in. They use their stands respectively to get in there. And we're in the last few pages of the chapter. So you think, okay, well, what's going to happen? What's going to get me to ch turn the page, to, to get excited for the chapter after this one, that being chapter three? Well, we get to see who the Japanese man is. With the introduction of his feet, that's the first part we see of him. He's swimming through the pool. We yet to see his face. The next page, Joe Dio is taking a look at him, and he says, with shock on his face, he says, I know that guy. He's famous. I've got his books in my house, and I'm always watching the anime ad adaptations online. I get it now. I know why he's holed up in here all by himself. Turn the page. Coming out of the pool, brushing his wet hair back with his earrings on. We get two immaculate portraits of Rohan Kishibi, the man himself, the mangaka, Rohan Kishibi, in the flesh. And that's how the chapter ends. Now let me tell you, there were a lot of characters that I was expecting to pop up. There was the obvious one being Josuke. There were the less obvious ones being Jobin, uh, Joshu. Uh, the the guy that Joseph ran into at the very end of Part 8. I think the last person that anybody expected to be in this house was Rohan. The man himself. This isn't alternate universe Rohan. This isn't Rohan but by name alone. This is 
headband wearing, earring wearing, most likely heaven's door bearing Rohan in the flesh. Now that came out of left field, that was like an overhand right to the jaw sent me down and got me extremely excited for the rest of this because obviously he's paying homage to the in original introduction of Rohan, that being let's go to Amangaka's house way back in part four. So that was the chapter. Will he introduce Josuke? Will he reintroduce those characters? Yasuo, Josuke, Joshu. What is going to happen inside this house that Jodio says for it wouldn't have no amount of us would have been enough. Not four, not five, not an army. Because obviously Rohan has Heaven's Door. He can completely incapacitate the team. No problem. If he still has Heaven's Door in its original form. We've seen these stands come out before. We've seen the world, and it's exactly the world, right? Back in Steel Ball Run. We've seen uh, Killer Queen, right? That's almost exactly like the Killer Queen of old. So will Heaven's Door just be Heaven's Door? We know how much Araki likes Rohan. I'm interested to see where the story goes. I hope you guys are too. I'll be sure to be reviewing it as they come out. Keeping you guys updated with this format of video. I'll have more JoJo videos for you guys in the future very soon. Be sure to subscribe, like, comment. Tell me what you think of it. Have you read it? Are you going to be keeping up with it? What's going on? I really want to know. Be sure to tell me all that. Check the links in the description. That's my social media pages. You can find all my artwork anywhere I'm going to be around the South Texas area. Right? Check out my short story in the uh, description below. Other than that, I'll see you guys later.